shring ka e i la ring asa ka la ring sa ka la ring sa hoin kling ring shring namaste so today we're going to cover the first line of the maha shodashi mantra <laughs> which makes me extremely blissful. The first line goes, Aum Shring Ring Kling Aing Sao. Now the uh, sound at the end is called Aishwarya. And uh, it's, uh, you see it in the Sanskrit as a double dot, like a colon. And what it means is that the final vowel is aspirated with the sound ha. So, for example, the final vowel is a, ah, it would be a ah, ha. Okay? And here it's ow, sao, hu. so sao, hu. sao, ho. Huh? So, uh, this is a case ending in Sanskrit, so it changes the meaning. And spiritually, what it does is it takes the energy that has been gathered by chanting the previous uh, mulas, I mean, sorry, bijas, and then it broadcasts that energy throughout the entire subtle body. Sahu. Okay, we'll explain more when we explain the meaning of sao. But first we have to start from ao. Ao, ao, We explained the significance of ng, the nasal sound, uh, the dot, the bindu. Ma, the letter ma, m, with a dot over it, is bindu. And this bindu is very powerful. And this is the energy, like just like a ha, broadcasts the energy throughout the subtle body. The ng sound at the end makes it move up into the Agnya Chakra and crystallizes it so that it, the influence can be carried over into the next life. So how powerful is that? So, I'm going to read a little bit about Aung. Aung is also called Omkara or uh, Pranava. Every authentic Vedic mantra begins and ends with Aung. Kularnava Tantra 1557 says that beginning a mantra without Aung causes impurity of birth. Further, Chandogya Upanishad begins by saying, Aung Itietat Akshara Mudgita Mupasita. Aung is closest to Brahman. So recite this syllable as part of your worship. And above all, the three Vedas begin with Aung. According to Chandogya Upanishad, Aung at the beginning refers to Brahman. And Mundakya, sorry, Mandukya Upanishad, I always get those two mixed up. Mandukya Upanishad also says that Aung is both the cause and the effect, both Shiva and Shakti. Therefore, Aung should be prefixed to Mahashodashi Mantra, without which the mantra becomes ineffective. So, if you're chanting it one time, you would chant Aung and then the mantra and then Aung again at the end. Just like the way we used to do our endings here was Aung Harihi. Huh? Aung. Aung Harihi Aung. This is a Vedic mantra. So, normally, because every mantra begins with Aung, it also acts as the end of the previous mantra. 
Okay? So when we're chanting Mahashodashi Mantra repetitively, the Aung at the beginning of the mantra also serves to terminate the previous mantra. But when we chant it just one time, we want to put Aung both at the beginning and the end. Now another thing is the length. The uh, Mandukya Upanishad, I think I got that right again, was it Mundaka? <laughs> I have to look it up. The Mandukya Upanishad, there is a long section, two or three chapters devoted to Aung. Its meaning and derivation and how it is to be recited. So, in the Sanskrit alphabet, each letter not only has a sound, it also has a rhythm. You have long and short vowels. The Sanskrit alphabet goes uh, A, E, E, U, U, Ri, Ri. Okay, so there's a short and long version of each of the major vowels. Then the other vowels, A, I, Ao and um. A, I, and Ao are always long. So there's a rhythm, which is one pada is like one beat, like an eighth note. Two pada are like a quarter note. So if a uh is one pada, a uh is two padas. That's why it goes a uh, a uh, e e. See, one two one two like that. So each Sanskrit word also has a rhythm, which is the combined rhythm of all the vowels uh, and uh, consonants put together. So a a u u, but the long version. So each one is two padas. So the length of the syllable aung is three and a half padas. A is long, u is long, and ng with the bindu, ing, followed by a short pause, a half a beat pause. And what is that? It's because Aung represents the three stages of consciousness, waking, dreaming, and deep sleep, Aung. And then the tiny pause at the end represents the fourth. Okay. And this is the transcendental state. And um, those who are enlightened will know this. Huh? So the Aum represents the complete possibilities of consciousness as a human being. Beyond a human being, well, that's another story. <laughs> but as a human being, as a sadhaka, you have A, U, N, and Turiya, the fourth state of consciousness, which is actually all the other three combined. So when you're in a state of yoga, when chanting mantras or doing pujas or doing some kind of other meditation, sadhana, whatever, when you reach actual yoga, joining with God, yoga yuktaha paras prasanatma, there it is, that when you're in the stage of linking, linking with God, prasanatma, you know, you feel this uh, being bliss, uh, this, this ecstasy just of being alive, being conscious. Uh, consciousness of consciousness, awareness of awareness. And when that becomes pure, that's the Turiyatita, which is the final state beyond all distinctions. So that's the story of Aung. <laughs> Aung is really, really the only mantra you need, if you understand it. Uh, but because most people don't, we have to chant it as part of other mantras until we realize it. 
So next is Shring, which is known as Shri Bija or Lakshmi Bija. This is the most important Bija of Mahasodashi Mantra because by adding this Bija, the 15 lettered Panchadashi becomes the 16 lettered Shodashi Mantra. Shri Bija provides auspiciousness. It promotes positive attitude and positive growth in the mind of the aspirant. This bija is the root cause for faith, devotion, love, and ultimate surrender unto her. This is why any great spiritual personality is addressed as Sri, Sri Guruji. Huh? and why the great mantras and also the great Vedic works are also called Sri. Like Sri Tripura Rahasya, huh? the story of the goddess. Everything that's prefixed with Sri has all the qualities of Sri. Beauty, attractiveness, artistic expression, appropriateness, deep wisdom, uh, you know who Sri is, the goddess of fortune, the wife of Vishnu. So we call Sri Vishnu, huh? like that. This means that she becomes the energy of that particular form of God. So when we find people performing karma yoga and devotional service under the regulative principles, this is being guided by Sri. And because of this, these activities are very auspicious, which means they indicate there is a good result coming, a, a future which is better than the present. So we like to chant Sri. Sri is very powerful. So first, we have to have faith in the goddess. And faith is attained by hearing from the scriptures, from the guru, and from realized beings. This faith, which is a kind of trust in the future, later on matures into devotion, which is devotional ecstasy, love ecstasy in the present. And when devotion is mature, it becomes prema, ecstatic, transcendental love for the goddess. She is prema. Huh? She is the form of prema. She is the root of prema. And she is the one who distributes prema all over the universe to her devotees. This love, this prema alone, and the immense satisfaction that it brings makes the aspirant surrender unto her. I've often said when talking about meditation that the mind is very difficult to concentrate, very difficult to control. And the way we can control the mind is through beauty. See, the, the goddess is known as Saundarya Lahari, uh, a, a tsunami, a tidal wave in the ocean of beauty. So, it's another meaning of Sri. As Sri Bija is the cause for surrender unto her, it leads the aspirant to liberation. Because unless you surrender, you're not going to get liberation. As long as the ego is there, and especially as long as the ego is in, is in control. Uh, if it's not being disciplined, uh, then you're not going to get liberation. You have to conquer the ego, conquer the mind. Not destroy them, but bring them under control. And that is done through beauty and love and ecstasy. So, Sri combines three characters. Sha, Ra, Yi, Nada, mm, and Bindu, mm. Sha refers to Mahalakshmi, the goddess of wealth. Ra refers to wealth. So Ra Bija is also known as Agni Bija because it can confer supernatural power. 
There's some devotees that simply chant Ram, 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 Ram. Huh? They become very powerful. Nada is consciousness about to manifest in the universe. It hasn't manifested yet, but it's about to manifest. So what is it really? Pure awareness. Turiatita. This also means subtle sound. Subtle sound is the actual uh, nature of mantra. So this is also called nada. The sound that is made by closing both the lips mm, is called nada. It is a humming nasal sound like the sound of a tanpura. You've heard in the beginning of the video the tanpura. Huh? It makes kind of a sound, right? Well, that is how each bija should be terminated, like aum, uh, shring, uh, shring, ring, kling, aing, you see? Without nada, bija cannot be affected, effective because bindu cannot be pronounced by itself, not in a bija anyway. It has to have that link. Nada Bindu refers to the union of Shiva and Shakti, where Nada means Shakti and Bindu means Shiva. So see, this Bindu is much more than just a dot. It actually has nine components, and we'll explain that in a later video. It's kind of complicated. The Bindu, above the termination of a bija, removes sorrows and negative energies in the mind of the aspirant. Based on this fact, it is said that the Shodashi mantra is capable of offering moksha because it removes all sorrow. It is also said, Shodashi mantra kevalang moksha sadhana. Uh, this mantra is the pure sadhana for liberation. Kevala moksha sadhana which means that it only offers liberation, not any uh, smaller thing. <laughs> of course, everything is included within that, right? So this is the ultimate goal of the Vedas and of all, all sentient beings. And since liberation is not so easily attainable, then this mantra is the most valuable gift, the most valuable method or service that anyone can perform. Aum Tatsa, Buddha Sharanai. <laughs>